Why does the unconscious sometimes get stuck on repeat, sending us recurring images or situations? Recurring dreams are some of the most interesting to consider since they come to us over and over again, making themselves feel really important. They give us even more clues when they change over time. From dreams of being back in high school to children in the attic, black horned creatures to killing a neighbor, I'll show you how to make sense of the language of dreams. and welcome to The Stuff of Dreams. I'm your host, Amy Lawson, and my goal is to connect you with your dreams in a more fun and meaningful way so you can interpret the messages your unconscious is sending. All right, are you excited? I hope you're excited because I'm pretty excited about this episode. Whenever I'm on Reddit interpreting dreams and I see that label of recurring, it's like I'm just drawn to it. They just have such power in a lot of people's psyches and when the unconscious is sending the same or similar messages over and over again, I just want to find out what that is. So today I have four different dreams or sets of dreams to tell you about. They're all from various people on Reddit. I'm going to give you a break this week from being tortured by any of my dreams. Uh, I don't actually have recurring dreams. I have some recurring elements in dreams, but I, I don't have similar dreams that I have over and over again. Maybe it's because... My unconscious is like, you need so much help that we're not going to waste time sending you the same message over and over. You got to listen to something different every night. I don't know. That's my theory. So here's our first dreams. Um, the dreaded being back in high school. So many people have these. I read this all the time. So um, hopefully this will be applicable to some of you out there as well. Here's the post. At least once or twice a month, I dream I'm back in my old high school. Really, I graduated 12 years ago and went off to university. It's always the same scenario. I realize I've been missing classes, assignments, and forget which rooms I'm supposed to be in. In my dreams, I'm constantly explaining to someone that I'm not back because I have to get a degree, but that I would like to continue learning, which always surprises the people in my dreams. However, due to my full-time work, I'm no longer able to keep up with the demands of the classes and think about dropping some of the classes, except I never do, and I'm once again dreaming I'm back in school. Why do I keep having these dreams? What's the significance of this, and what is my subconscious trying to get across? So I think many people will dream occasionally or even frequently that they're back in high school or about people from back in high school. And I think there are several reasons for that. I think one is, especially school, junior high and high school, was a really formative time for most people's psyches. You know, it's when you're starting to really exert your independence, you're starting to develop deeper and different kinds of relationships you're starting to be able to chart your own course a little bit more. And so all of that is really rich with symbols and people and situations that your unconscious can draw from when it's looking for, you know, some kind of symbol or metaphor to talk to you about what's going on currently in your psyche. Oh, and I'm going to add an aside here because I feel like I'm always typing this on Reddit when people are like, why am I dreaming of this person from high school that I haven't seen in 20 years? Why are they coming up now? Is it because they're thinking of me too or something? I mean, I suppose that could be. But in general, I think that these people represent certain active parts of ourselves. And so if you find yourself suddenly dreaming about some random person from high school, think about what that person meant to you. What might they be symbolizing? Were they the party girl that just wanted to have a good time? Were they the class clown? Were they, you know, the jock with all the social power? Were they the disenfranchised band geek? You know, think about the qualities of that person that most stick out to you and then think about what part of yourself that might be representing. Hope that helps. Okay, back to this dream. In this dream, the dreamer knows that she's back in school, not because she needs to graduate, but because she wants to continue learning. And so my first question is, where is that dynamic in her life right now? Where is she wanting to go back and do something just for the learning and the fun of it instead of for the end goal of getting a degree or finishing the project or some other more clear end goal? But then it sounds like the main emotion that this dream causes is overwhelm because she knows she's working full time and she can't keep up with the demands of the classes and she should drop some of them, but she doesn't and she just keeps feeling too busy. So this is an image from the unconscious of being overloaded, being too busy, feeling like everything's piling on you, that you can't, that you don't have enough time to get everything done that you need to. And to me, that's a message urging 
priorities and prioritizing. You know, there's there's only so much time in the day, although it feels like they've gotten a lot longer during the pandemic, right? But there's only so much time in your life. There's only so much mental energy that you can expend. And to me, this dream sounds like the dreamer trying to do it all, work and go to school and learn new things and satisfy the demands of everybody. She says she has dreams like this once or twice a week. So my suspicion is this has been kind of a chronic condition. Um, a person who likes to say yes to everything and doesn't like to acknowledge the fact that she's too busy or feeling overwhelmed. So her unconscious just keeps sending her this same message time and again that will, number one, speak to how busy she is and how she's trying to get everything done. And number two, evoke those emotions of feeling overwhelmed and not having enough time to do everything. Because I really do think that the content of the dream and the emotion that it evokes I think those two things are inextricably related and make each other stronger. So that's the interpretation that I sent her and her response to me was, first of all, I was waiting for you to respond. I've seen your comments on other posts and I'm a big fan of Jung, so I wanted to see what you'd make of this. So thank you. I probably shouldn't include that in my podcast, but I thought it was really funny because I was like, what? She's watching that I'm interpreting other people's and hoping that I do hers. I just, I don't know. It still feels strange to me to feel recognized for <laughs> dream interpretation instead of all the other stuff that I've done in my life. So uh, I don't know why I'm telling you that. I need to own my authority. Okay. And then she goes on. Second, I've been reflecting on this all day and have come up with many things that I'm currently doing that I could probably do without. I think it's time I cut out some responsibilities that are not mandated of me, but self-imposed. Okay, good. So message received from her unconscious, right? Uh, sounds like the interpretation pretty much hit home for her. So here's the interesting thing. The next day she messaged me and said, I can't help but reflect on the details that presented themselves in my latest dream. So I think this is something that she had the night after she acknowledged that message from her unconscious of the, the busyness aspect. Yesterday's was a bit more detailed and I'm trying to make sense of it. I enter a classroom. As I walk down the rows, I recognize my two best friends, both of which are having marital problems. A friend who I have a spiritual connection with, whose name is, we'll call him Ken for privacy reasons. And oddly, a lawyer I work with whose name is also Ken. The lawyer has a degree in philosophy, and though I don't know him much, I've always thought he must be wise and deep if he's studied philosophy, and therefore I think him an intellect. I now recognize that I have a hard choice of who to sit next to. I decide to sit in front of the lawyer and immediately across from my spiritual friend, Ken, who smiles endearingly when I sit down. I feel his positive energy and smile back. The only other detail I recall is leaning back into my chair and feeling the lawyer's knee against my back, which made me feel good. I'm a 30-something-year-old female and married. I do not have a relationship with these two men, but I think they are ideas of spirituality and intellect presenting themselves in my dreams. I'm curious as to why I avoided sitting next to my best friends. Any thoughts? So the dream has changed. It's using new details now. And I see this happen a lot. When we've acknowledged a certain message from a dream, finally, it can move on and it can change. And it's those changes that can really tell us, number one, we've paid attention to it. And number two, okay, here's the next thing you got to deal with. So we're still back in high school, but now we've got her choosing where to sit and avoiding her two best friends in order to sit near these men that represent the spiritual and the intellectual. Well, the first high school dreams she was telling us about were definitely about her inner dynamics. And so I think that's true for this one as well. Even though these are all people that she knows in real life, they're really representing parts of herself and her internal dynamics. So to me, the main event in this dream is her choosing to sit near the two people who represent spirituality and philosophy and intelligence and knowledge one of whom smiles at her and the other who makes physical contact in a pleasant way. And I think that represents her consciously choosing a path along those lines right now, or her unconscious is nudging her to choose that path of deepening her spirituality or her intellect in some way, learning new things, um, focusing on interior spiritual or philosophical work in some way. And as she points out, she actively avoids her best friends and wants to know why. Well, 
we don't have a lot to go on, but the one thing she does tell us about her best friends in real life is that they're both having marital problems. And so to me, that gives us two options about how to interpret them, depending on how strictly we apply the all characters are parts of ourselves rule. These two women could represent parts of the dreamer that are dealing with poor connections or difficult interpersonal relationships, you know, difficult or contentious dynamics. And it could be her unconscious nudging her toward the pursuit of those higher things like spirituality and learning right now instead of dealing with some of the messier relationships. Or if we take a more literal approach to this, you know, it can be really hard to support people through marital problems, through difficult situations. It can take a lot of energy. And so maybe this is her unconscious saying, don't expend that energy right now. This isn't the time to use it to support other people, especially when you're feeling so busy. This is the time to support yourself and really work on yourself. So after that interpretation, she responded, that 100% resonates. Now that you've made that clear, I can see I've already chosen to embark on a spiritual path and pave the way for myself away from people's negative energies. This dream makes a lot of sense now. I included this set of dreams so that we could talk about those high school dynamics and why it shows up in our psyche so much. And so we could see how dreams sometimes change when we have actively acknowledged their messages. On to our second set of dreams. Here's the next dreamer's Reddit post. I haven't had this dream in a very long time, but I had it so recurrently from ages about two to six that it's really burned into my mind. The dream takes place in a log cabin located in the woods. In the attic, there are three of me present. One is on the far side of the room staring out the window, another's in the center of the room at a table drawing, and the third one is on the other side of the room looking down the stairs. The one at the stairs would yell something like, here comes, blank, and we'd all run over to see a witch coming up the stairs. About halfway up the stairs, the witch would morph into whatever blank would be that night, a frog, my sister, whatever. I've always wondered if the dream could have some sort of meaning to it. I do love to draw now. It just seems like such a weirdly specific dream for a child to have. These dreams were nightmares for the dreamer, so I hesitate to call them fascinating, but they really are a good example of how we really are born with archetypes. Even children's brains know how to use these symbols and metaphors in a way that we can connect with. I really think that children's dreams that are wise like this and show similar imagery to adult dreams just prove that we really do have an inner self that's more whole and more wise than our conscious ego at any point in our life. And it is constantly trying to communicate with us in whatever way it can. So let's consider the dream geography. This dream takes place in a log cabin in the woods. And already, even from that first image, we're getting a sense of somewhere more remote, somewhere out in nature, out in the country. It's a different feel than if this was taking place in a busy city with people all around. So I already wonder if this dreamer was feeling, you know, remote and some kind of loss of connections back then, or like she was alone. And the setting for the dream is this house where the dreamer is in the attic. And whatever scary is happening in the dream is coming up the stairs from below. Well, houses often represent our whole psyche. And so the attic being up at the top symbolizes the brain, symbolizes the conscious ego, the place where we're usually functioning from. I think it's really interesting that there are three of her in this attic, but she definitely recognizes them as all being herself. The central one, the one that I think is probably most identified with her, is the one that's sitting at a table drawing. And to me, it feels like the two other ones are both keeping guard in different ways, because one of them is at the far end looking out the window, and the other one is looking down the stairs. I think these are probably parts of the dreamer that she really needed to keep active to protect herself. She was probably always on the lookout for whatever next was going to happen. She knew she needed to 
protect herself as the one doing the art, and she did have some defenses even back then. And then there's the witch coming up the stairs. If this was an adult dream, I think I would go to my usual perspective of that's some part of yourself coming up from the unconscious that feels threatening, but I don't know if I think that about such a young child's dream. To me, that feels more like something external that's coming up from below, something more, something threatening, but that's coming from outside and trying to come into her conscious ego attic and get her somehow. And then with each dream, the witch turns into something different. So that's the part of the dream that I think probably was customized from whatever happened that day. You know, if it was a day when the witch was turning into her sister, then maybe that was a day when she had some really difficult fights or dynamics with her sister somehow. If the witch was turning into an animal, then that could symbolize, you know, some other characteristic of a person that she was feeling threatened by or a part of herself she was feeling threatened by. So I floated that interpretation. Really, this is the kind of dream that you need a little bit more back and forth with, but luckily I did get that, so... She mentions, the meanings behind the house and the attic and there being three of me definitely resonate. I grew up shy in a rather violent household, and I definitely did have my guard up a lot growing up. The dreams were always scary, though the more I had them, the more I knew what was about to happen. There would be an impending doom. The witch was always terrifying. There was also once or twice where I managed to see the main floor of the cabin. It was cluttered with potions and skulls, very dusty. The first time I had this dream, I thought it was fascinating, but then it led directly into the usual dream with the witch. It might also be worth mentioning that from the time I was an infant to about three, I spent a lot of time with a very abusive babysitter. Anyway, I hope this feedback helps. I'm living in a much healthier environment now, but these dreams have always stuck with me. Well, I never like to hear about children with trauma, and I'm sorry that the dreamer needed to have these dreams, but I do think that that image of the three of herself, two of whom were guarding her main self, is a positive image of, you know, having those resources and defenses that could warn her when something bad was about to happen. I think this example shows that children have dreams that send them important messages too. So if any of you are parents out there, try to get your kids to tell you their dreams and you may find out something about what's going on for them right now. The next set of two dreams is interesting because the dreamer had them back to back in the same night. So here's what happened. I had this weird dream two nights ago. It started with me and a couple of friends hanging out at night. We decided to play cornhole, which is rare because I've never played it before or thought about playing it. For those of you who don't know, it's like a game where you throw beanbags at a target. Everyone was on top of this hill and one friend was on the bottom tossing some beanbags toward us. One friend pointed out this figure with black horns behind a fence. Slowly, the thing stands up, and I could feel it staring at us. It had a human-like body and horns, but I could only see an outline. I remember vividly that each time I blinked, it came closer to my friend at the bottom of the hill. Once it came close, it wrapped its arms around her throat, trying to choke her. We were all screaming, and then I woke up. I was terrified, but eventually I fell asleep again, and this time it was the same dream, yet different. Same people, same game, same hill— but this time we were playing with this thing. What's weird is that we didn't seem afraid. It seemed like it was our friend. I woke up and I was scared, yet I wanted to know the meaning behind it. So she had these two dreams back to back after waking in the middle, and the same figure was in the second dream, but was no longer scary. Why the sudden change? Well, this one is interesting. I know I say that about all the dreams, but they all are interesting. Okay. So let's go to the dream geography first. It's nighttime, so that suggests that we're somewhere near the unconscious realms. And most of the people are up on this hill. So up closer to consciousness, up where they can see quite far, up where they feel a bit more in control. And they're playing this game. And then this black horned creature comes that she always calls the thing. And this thing comes and is threatening a friend or a certain part of the dreamer trying to choke her. Well, a black thing with horns makes me think of makes me think of Ares the war god, makes me think of Viking horns, makes me think of conflict and violence. Definitely seems like sort of a masculine threatening image to me. 
So I think it could represent something external that she's feeling threatened by, or it could represent some more aggressive internal part of herself that wants to kill other parts of her somehow, wants to take over them and be in charge. But the important thing is in the second dream, without even any conversation or thinking about it, the thing is just there playing the game with them. And they're not afraid of it anymore. It's no longer threatening them. It's their friend. That shift is really powerful. I think this dream is telling her that there's some more aggressive part of her that wants to be let out and she's afraid of it and afraid to do that. But that if she does and she just accepts it, it's going to become her friend and not be threatening anymore. I wonder if she needs a little more aggression in her life somehow. Sometimes people who are, you know, the typical nice people and say yes to everything get all their boundaries walked on all the time. And sometimes those people need these more aggressive parts of themselves for self-protection and to draw those boundaries so that other people can't take advantage of them. So I sent her that interpretation and just asked her to think about what might be going on right now that her unconscious is telling her needs to be dealt with more aggressively than she has been and that she doesn't need to feel scared about that. So her reply to me was, wow, thank you. It makes sense now. I'm speechless. Again, thank you. So we didn't get any details, but it sounds like at least some of that hit home. I really liked how quickly this dream almost resolved itself, that Without any conscious effort by the dreamer, the thing turned from a threat to almost a friend. It's like her unconscious wanted to show her how easily that could happen if she could accept that part of herself. And I find this a lot with nightmare figures when I hear from people about their dreams over time, and even with a few of my nightmare figures, that if we acknowledge them instead of pushing them away, or if we watch and try to listen to them or try to see how the dreams are going to change, they often do and they often change for the better. I don't think nightmare figures are sent just to scare us. I think they're sent to, you know, deliver some more detailed message as well about what we're afraid of or what we need to face. At school a few years ago, we had an assignment where we had to go back into a nightmare and try to talk to the nightmare figure to see what they wanted or what would happen. And so I had just had this dream of this big black worm thing that was hidden behind my stove. So he got flipped out from there and he freaked out and crawled up on me and started biting my head. And it was terrifying. I guess worms don't have teeth, but in the dream, he definitely had teeth. So I gathered some imaginal allies and went back into the dream, trying to feel a little safer and trying to talk to him and really just found out that like, he was cold. He wanted to be behind the stove to be warm. And then he got flipped out from under there and he was mad and he felt defensive. And so he attacked me. He just wanted somewhere to be warm. And so I could then let him go over to the window where there was a pool of light. And he curled up there and became this like really small little green snake that I used to have in real life. So he wasn't a scary nightmare figure anymore trying to bite me. He was just an animal following his instincts. I mean, I think he probably represented, you know, something more primitive in me that I haven't been paying attention to or something. But I told you I wouldn't do any of my dreams this week. So that's as much as I'll do. But if you can gather the courage sometimes to go back into these dreams in your waking life and talk to the characters, sometimes things can change. That whole process is called active imagination. And if you want to read more about it, check out the link on my website to the book called Inner Work. All right, last dreams. Here's what this dreamer wrote to me. The first dream was three months ago. I dreamt of casually going inside a house and killing a neighbor, one that I don't recognize and doesn't resemble my real neighbor at all, and taking all of his money. I hit his head with something, he looked at my face, then I proceeded to break his face until he died. In that dream, I made sure that no evidence would be found and made a throwaway Reddit account to seek advice on how to make sure I wouldn't be caught. Other neighbors noticed that someone was murdered and called the cops, so I went out and pretended that I was concerned and acted like I didn't know what happened. I didn't get caught, dream ended. The next dream happened two hours ago. The neighbors in my dream are now suspecting that I did it. I was manipulating them into thinking that it was done by a robber from the ghetto near our place, and it seemed like it was working. 
But then I remembered that I got rid of all the evidence except for one, the throwaway account that I made, and I was worried that the cops could trace my IP address, and the dream ended. Why am I dreaming about this? This is something I would never do. It all seemed real, especially the one about me going to Reddit. Also, I had absolutely no remorse in my dream. So, a dream of killing someone. I'm going to go back to the usual theory of seeing the dream characters as parts of ourselves. And so to me, this dream is about the dreamer symbolically killing off some part of himself that he doesn't like or he wants to repress or ignore or change somehow and stealing its money, symbolizing its riches or its resources to be used by his conscious ego. So I asked him if he had any sense of what kind of person the neighbor was in the dream. Why would he have chosen that particular person to kill to give us some more clues about which part of him the dream might be referring to. And in the second dream, we have all the neighbors being suspicious. So I think that killing off this part of himself has disturbed all the other parts of his psyche and they're suspicious. So he's afraid he's going to get caught, meaning that his psyche is afraid that killing off this certain part of himself is going to have consequences. So again, I asked if he could think of anywhere in his life right now where some aspect of him is feeling killed off or murdered. And he replied, the person in my dream was skinny, had a tattoo on his left upper back. His hair was like 70s, like the Bee Gees or the Beatles. He wasn't wearing a shirt and was sitting on a small chair and watching TV. I don't remember having a reason to kill him. I just went in and bashed his head. The guy didn't resemble me. I'm kind of fat, no tattoos. My hair's long enough to man bun because of no barbershops because of the quarantine. If there's a part of me that I killed, it might be the person that I was a year ago. I graduated with a business course, but I'm now working my way to qualify as an officer in the army. I lost a lot of weight, and I'm considering being a politician after serving. I also broke up with my four-year ex-girlfriend last month. We're on good terms, but I explained that I can't take care of a relationship right now because of my ambition to join the army and become a politician. So now this neighbor really sounds like a shadow figure for this guy. Remember that the shadow um, is full of all the parts of ourselves that we want to repress that don't seem socially acceptable or culturally acceptable for us. And so if his new ambition is to be an army officer and a politician, then he wants to have a really squeaky clean, positive, straight-laced image. He wouldn't want to be seen as some tattooed, shirtless, long-haired person with all the connotations of, you know, drugs and loose morals or whatever you think about hippies. And actually that hippie correlation, I mean, you know, with all the free love, you know, in real life, this guy just ended a relationship that he didn't feel like he could take care of. So that may be another part of himself that he was symbolically killing off the, the part that was able to have tattoos and long hair and be all about love. So after that interpretation, he replied, thanks a lot, man. I can understand my dream better now. That man could be part of me that I want to get rid of. I can now stop overthinking that it's going to happen in the future, LMAO. So I think this series of two dreams showing the continuation of the story just wouldn't quite let the dreamer off the hook and wanted him to acknowledge that even if it was a positive thing, he is killing off some shadow parts of himself. I don't think we've talked very much about the shadow on the podcast yet, so let's do that a little bit. Shadow figures do come up in dreams a lot because the shadow is one of the most easily reached parts of our unconscious. It's almost like it's the opposite of our persona because whatever parts of us we consider really great and we want to show to the outside world and make into our persona or our mask, the opposites of those are what goes into our shadow as what we're embarrassed of or what we think is too primitive about us or what our family or our culture or our society has told us shouldn't be acceptable for us. But it's important to realize that there are strengths located within the shadow as well. Just because we haven't seen these parts of ourselves as particularly desirable doesn't mean that they aren't a source of strength or resources sometimes. Doesn't mean that they couldn't help us if we cultivated them and integrated them more. Sometimes our conscious ego doesn't want to claim those shadow parts, not because they are too negative, but because 
their strengths and it would mean too much responsibility or too much of a change to our self-image if we really claimed those parts of ourselves. I'm going to read you a quote by Robert Johnson in his book, Inner Work, that I think illustrates this beautifully. If we have the courage to look with open minds at some of the instincts and energy systems within that we've been so ashamed of, we almost always find that they can also be positive strengths and that they are merely normal parts of a total human character. As with all our inner contents, they need to be acknowledged, honored, and lived on an appropriate and constructive level. It takes courage to go to the bad side of ourselves, to acknowledge it as part of ourselves, to consider that it could have a constructive role to play in our lives. I think these points are relevant here to this dream because remember the parts of this dreamer that we see he's been repressing into his shadow. The shadow figure that he kills has tattoos and isn't wearing a shirt and has long hair. None of those things in and of themselves are necessarily negative. There's no problem with having a tattoo or not wanting to wear a shirt all the time. There's no problem with having long hair. We talked about that it might be kind of a hippie figure that could represent, you know, more freedoms, free love, more intense relationships. And there's nothing inherently wrong with wanting love and connection. And that's what I mean about shadow characteristics not always being negative. It's just that for this particular dreamer, because he has chosen certain parts of himself that he thinks are acceptable and desirable for his life goals of being an officer in the army and then maybe a politician, he needs to repress the parts of himself that are less disciplined and more connected to other people that he needs to take care of so that he can pursue his own independent goals. He has chosen a particular life path and he has moved away from his long-term relationship in a deliberate and considered manner. So that's fine. And his unconscious is just making the point with this dream that he's prioritizing some parts of himself over others. And those parts that he has repressed into his shadow are feeling like they've been killed. There's a general arc in Jungian psychology where we see children as born whole and integrated and connected. And then as they are raised by their family and affected by their culture and their society, certain parts of their wholeness get retained in consciousness and certain parts get placed into the shadow as undesirable. So Jung thought that we spend the first 30 or 40 years of our lives developing our individuality and really dividing ourselves into what's in our consciousness and what we're going to put in the unconscious. And then we spend the time from midlife to the end of life trying to recover some of that, trying to reintegrate ourselves, trying to develop those parts of ourselves that have so far gone unused in order to integrate them into a bigger wholeness of our self. And as always, I'd like to thank all the dreamers from today's show for being so generous and allowing us to share in the stories from your psyche and learn from them. I really do still continue to learn from other people's unconsciouses as well as my own. So that's the show. In the next episode, we'll look at some animal dreams with the help of my friend and fellow dream enthusiast, Tamara Walker. Head on over to my website at stuffofdreams.fireside.fm to find show notes for each episode where I summarize the dream interpretation principles we discuss each week. You can also find links there to my favorite dream interpretation book, our subreddit, and my email for sending me your dreams. Thank you so much for listening, and if you liked it, I encourage you to tell a friend about it this week. Let's get more people fluent in the language of dreams. Bye for now, and I hope you dream tonight. Tonight.